When we talk about television ratings, they can be easily misconstrued. I mean, what do they even represent? Is a 4.4 good or bad? Well, it's actually simpler than you might think, and to explain, I'd like to introduce you to the Nielsen rating. Who is Neil and who is his son? Well, you see, A.C. Nielsen created the rating in 1950, and since then it's been the cornerstone for measuring on-air success. You have a higher rating? Good job, people are watching your stuff. You have a lower one? You get canned while The Simpsons enter season 35. <coughs> but why do we latch so much importance onto a simple single-digit number? Well, it's more than just a number, it's an estimated percentage of all televisions in the US, meaning that if you got a 10, it's likely that 10% of all American viewers watched your show at the time it aired. And if you have to put your rating into scientific notation, I've got some bad news. You can see why this number is such a big deal, as a mere tenth in variance could account for hundreds of thousands of people. And as a fan of a sport with a dwindling fan base, let me tell you, NASCAR fans live and die by these numbers. Viewership goes up, all right, that's good, keep doing what we're doing. If it goes down, tear up the track, redesign the cars, and fire the executives out of cannons. It's true, at times we might exude a little too much passion, but it's for good reason. Whereas other sports have had to climb to reach their heights, we started at the very top. On a breezy day in eastern Florida, where 41 drivers strapped in to kick off a season like no other. A year that, in many ways, formed NASCAR as we know it. Actually, we have to go back a bit, because the season doesn't start here. It actually starts on the other side of the country at the now-defunct Riverside International Raceway. That's right, before the Super Bowl of stock car racing was put at the tippity-top of the docket, NASCAR would kick off its season here in mid-January from 1963 to 1981. Eventually, the race would be moved to the other end, with the track hosting the season finales until 1986 and even bookending the schedule in 1981, but for now, it remains as the opener. And despite being followed by a literal once-in-a-lifetime affair, the 79 Winston Western 500 found its own place in history as the last road course race to go caution-free, a record that was nearly broken a few weeks ago, but thanks to Alan Gustafson, it still stands to this day. And now that stage cautions are back at the Roval, I think this record will stand the test of time. But don't let it fool you. This race had its fair share of jockeying, but leading three-fourths of the laps and dominating his way to victory was a relatively young hotshot, a driver who, in more ways than one, speaks for himself. You got any comment? Did you, you, you got anything to say? You don't have to get you bossy. You Yankees are all alike. Back to the top. <laughs> this was Kentucky native Darrell Waltrip's first of eventual five wins at Riverside and 16th of his 84 Cup Series victories overall. By this point, he's more than proven his belonging. And while Darrell and Dygard both have yet to win the big prize, they have gotten closer. 8th in 76, 4th in 77, 3rd in 78, these guys had become strong contenders. And now, at the start of 79, they have a 10-point lead heading into the Great American Race. A moniker given to the Daytona 500 by broadcaster Ken Squire, who despite not holding a place on the grid will still have an immeasurable impact on this season and the sport as a whole. Up to this point, the most exposure NASCAR's received is being a segment on ABC's Wide World of Sports. But Ken envisioned something greater. He knew the amount of pull that the sport had in the Southeast, and if it were presented to the entire nation, could become a national phenomenon like the NFL or MLB. When he submitted his idea to the higher-ups at CBS, he did receive some pushback. I mean, who wants to watch a bunch of country bumpkins turn left for four hours? But his pitch must have been pretty damn good, because CBS relented and agreed to broadcast the Daytona 500 in its entirety. An entire 500-mile race, flag to flag. The first time it had ever been done. It was a huge moment for the sport. But before we get to that, we have one more race to cover. The first ever running of the Bush Clash. Today, this race is run like a short track slugfest at the LA Coliseum. But back then, it was simpler. Because the series pole sponsor was Bush, you want a pole, you get to race. And since the 78 season only featured nine pole sitters, only nine cars participated in the inaugural clash. Now, DW did put up a good fight, and admittedly might have been saving his stuff for the 500 the following week, but driving a gray and black Oldsmobile, aptly given the name Gray Ghost, it would be Buddy Baker winning the inaugural clash, and then getting the pole in qualifying, and then winning his twin 125 heat race. With these three dubs, he had a chance to do something that no one had done before and no one has ever done since. Win them all. Every Cup Series event throughout Daytona Speed Weeks. This is still one of the last great records to claim, but in the moment, it looked like Buddy could do it. And that takes us back to today, February 18th, 1979, quite possibly the most important day in NASCAR history. Good evening. The worst winter storm since the blizzard of 1967 has hit the Chicago area, leaving 16 inches of snow on the ground and threatening to dump another 5 inches on us during the night. As it so happens on this day, a massive blizzard blanketed the mid-Atlantic states in as much as 25 inches of bitter cold snow, trapping many people in their homes until the ensuing day. 
When CBS agreed to broadcast the race, they figured they'd receive a Nielsen rating around two. After all, that was over a million people, a strong stat for a first full broadcast. But because of the snowstorm, they received a bit of a boost of 16 million. The race received a rating of 10.5, which for comparison was 3.3 more than the NBA Finals that year, and was on par with the Super Bowl and the World Series. In its very first showing, the Daytona 500 was quite literally in the ballpark. It had the attention of more people than ever thought possible. And now, it was time to race. Or at least it should have been, if not for a rain shower that doused the track the night before. The drivers weren't so sure about throwing the green flag, so instead they threw a green-yellow, having the cars pace at higher speeds and get a feel for the track. Something we might consider doing again today instead of aimlessly throwing flags around, but I digress. One problem that emerged came from the previous race winner, Daryl Waltrip, who complained that the prolonged time spent on the banking left his camshaft unlubricated and forced him to run the rest of the race on just seven cylinders. A genuine concern, or perhaps an excuse for what would happen later. Buddy Baker would lead the field around 15 laps running half pace, though these would turn out to be the only laps he would lead all day. Yep, despite being the odds-on favorite, he would lose the draft not long after the green flag and drop out of the race with ignition problems caused by a simple crewman error. A repairer, if you will. That meant that it was anyone's game, and mimicking the super speedway races of today, the lead would change hands just about every five laps, with the early front runners being Donnie Allison, Bobby Allison, and Cale Yarborough. The Allison brothers have been chasing Cale for some time now, but for how many times they've stared at his back bumper, these three are about to get more familiar than they ever have before. Oh! He gets hit by his brother, he's all the way around. Kale Yarbrough's on the grass, that wet grass now incredibly slippery. It was unclear whether any of these guys could stay competitive, let alone compete, but for now, this opened the race up to just about anyone, including Neil Bonnet, who would get into it with rookie Harry Gant, Teague Scott, who would overshoot his pit box, and rookie Dale Earnhardt, who would over-rev his car and fry his motor. But don't worry, we haven't seen the last of him. Needless to say, it was a war of attrition, and after the final round of pit stops, the leaders would be who else but Donnie Allison, Bobby Allison, and Cale Yarborough. Well, Bobby was still multiple laps down, he just happened to be right there with them, but as for Donnie and Cale, they had made a full rebound, and now it was just them, mano y mano, with 22 laps to go. All the way to the white flag, the three-time defending champ sized up his prey, though unbeknownst to him, another champion was doing the same thing, a guy who, all things considered, I'm shocked we haven't talked about until now. You know who Richard Petty is. Oh, you don't? Well, he's the undisputed greatest in NASCAR history. Even on this day, 44 years ago, he holds more records than anyone could ever dream of having. They literally call him the king. Still don't know him? Well, he drives this car, the 43 with day glow red and the iconic Petty blue, one of the most famous car color combos in racing history. Really? Still not ringing any bells? All right, you see this guy? The king? Strip Weathers? That's Richard Petty, both the voice and the inspiration. So yeah, you know Richard Petty, and everyone ahead of Richard Petty knows Richard Petty. He's won six championships, he's won 185 races, hell, he's won this race five times. AJ Foyt knows him, and Daryl Waltrip knows him, which is probably why they thought better than to try and fight him. So with less than five laps to go, Petty passes them both for third place, but is still trapped about a half lap behind the leaders, who've been running nose to tail since their pit stops. With such an insurmountable gap, you wonder why he even tries to fight. But as the white flag waves, Yarborough finally pounces, and we get our answer. It's not over till the checkered flag waves. You know Richard Petty, and I know Richard Petty, but on this day in 1979, millions of people are unexpectedly going to meet the king for the very first time. It's just poetry in motion. He comes to the inside. Donnie Allison throws the block. Kale hits him. He slides. Donnie Allison slides. They hit again. They climb in the turn. They're hitting the wall. They're head on the wall. They slide down to the inside. Let's watch those third place cars. Here they come. Waltrip trying to slingshot. Despite this being his 186th career win, it was, by all accounts, an underdog story. As the previous season had seen his first winless year since 1959 and a surgery that almost sidelined him from this race. But here he was, and as Petty celebrates a win he might not have even known he had, the cameras cut to the backstretch. To who else but Donnie Allison, Bobby Allison, and Cale Yarborough. And there's a fight between Cale Yarborough and Donnie Allison. The tempers overflowing. They're angry. They know they have lost. 
and what a bitter defeat. I'd say that they should make a movie about this race, but they honestly couldn't script it any better. And the motorsport that originally couldn't get more than 30 minutes on an all-encompassing sports program found itself on the front page of the New York Times the next day. It was quite literally the perfect storm, and there were still 29 races left to run. A harsh $6,000 penalty wouldn't be enough to keep Donnie and Kale from running it back the following week, as they would once again crash from the lead, though at least this time they got it out of the way early on. This would kick off a campaign of rebound wins, with Bobby Allison winning Rockingham, Yarborough winning Richmond, Buddy Baker winning Atlanta, and Allison once again winning at the North Wilkesboro Speedway and taking the points lead from Daryl Waltrip. Both drivers came ready to rock when they rolled into Bristol for race 7, and for most of it, it seemed like it would be one of them wielding the sword. But with 27 laps to go, the tides would turn, as a rookie driver would pass them both and steal the win. His first win, the first of many for a man who would later become the most recognizable driver in American motorsport. I know I joked about knowing who Richard Petty is, but I don't care who you are, you know Dale Earnhardt. Whether you know him from his life or his death, you know the man. You know the mustache, and you know the Monty, or the Lumina, or maybe even his Camaro. But today, he's driving a blue and yellow Monte Carlo, a car that would eventually come back in black. And right now, he's leading all other rookies in the standings. Now, in the moment, it's hard to tell how a rookie class is gonna do, but that makes it even more special to look back on, as this rookie class, consisting of Terry Labonte, Jeff Bodine, Harry Gant, and Big E, would combine for 134 wins and nine championships. A very impressive feat, but the bulk of it belongs to this guy. And it all starts right here, where Dale gets his first, and Bobby expands his lead by five whole points. Unfortunately, he would experience engine woes that would give the lead right back to Waltrip at the Rebel 500 in Darlington, which Daryl would later go on to say was a life-changing race, as he had to go one-on-one -on -one with Richard Petty to win it. It was a big day that could have very well seen the emergence of Petty's new greatest rival, which was good, because his old one was caught in quite the pickle. To us, Richard Petty might be the greatest driver in history, but if you asked him, he'd give that title to this man. Anything like this ever happened to you before? No, never happened. Let's hope it never happens again, David. Well, thank you, Chris. Better luck next time. The Silver Fox could only muster three championships, but to this day still holds second to Petty on the wins tally at 105. And throughout their careers, the two gave us some of the fiercest battles in NASCAR lore. But this year, Pearson's fallen off. He finished second in that opening Riverside race, but since then hasn't finished better than 18th. And after a miscommunication on pit road that resulted in two of his wheels parting from the car, he simply gets out and walks away from his team for good. He had been the franchise of the Wood Brothers for seven years and got them 43 of their current 99 wins, but he couldn't win them a championship, and unknown to anyone at the time, he had just run his final race in the 21 car, which would now be driven by journeyman Neil Bonnet. Next up was Martinsville, where Richard Petty would collect his 15th and final grandfather clock, and then came a topsy-turvy day at Talladega, where only 16 cars would finish and Bobby Allison would live up to his title as leader of the Alabama gang. Then came a race in Nashville where Waltrip looked to dominate, as this was his home track and the site of his first win just four years ago. But Waltrip is uncharacteristically slow, leaving the checkered flag for Cale Yarborough. Possibly. As was fairly commonplace back in the day, drivers reported a scoring error with the second and third place Richard Petty and Bobby Allison contesting that Yarborough was supposed to be a lap behind them. Unfortunately for them, NASCAR let the win stand, though something no one could contest was the talent of Neil Bonnet. Because of NASCAR's never-ending struggle against the weather, they had to postpone qualifying at Dover to the same day as qualifying for the Indy 500, a race that Neil was supposed to compete in. So in a tough choice of putting team over driver, Bonnet withdrew from the 500 to run the NASCAR race at Dover, where he won his third career race and his first for the Wood Brothers, giving them just the shot in the arm they needed to stay afloat post-Pearson. After that came the World 600, where Waltrip would once again outdo a Petty and retake the points lead and further extend it with another win the following week at the Texas World Speedway, which would see the lowest attended NASCAR race of the modern era at just 11,500 people. But who knows? The Texas Motor Speedway seems to be closing in on that record. Something about those Lone Star circuits, man. After that came another race at Riverside, where Bobby Allison would beat the two championship frontrunners, then Buddy Baker would return to form with a win in Michigan, and then Neil Bonnet would get his second Wood Brothers win by beating Benny Parsons in the Firecracker 400 at Daytona. At this point, the season was over halfway done, and with a rebound win in the following race at Nashville, Darrell Waltrip had solidified an over 200-point lead. Not indomitable by any means, but still looking pretty damn good, although he would bobble the following week at Pocono. He led 62 laps on the day, and while under yellow with four laps to go, he pitted for tires. But as he did, the off-and-on rain that NASCAR had been dodging all weekend turned back on, and Waltrip would end up losing five spots worth 19 points. 19 points. Remember that, though that wasn't nearly the toughest defeat of this race. 
Somehow, this wasn't the toughest crash he'd experience at Pocono, as just three years later he would find himself in a much more gruesome one. But for now, Dale Earnhardt had suffered broken collarbones that would sideline him from racing for four weeks. In the meantime, David Pearson would take up driving duties in the two, and if you thought this race couldn't get any crazier, let me give you one more fun fact. A driver that to this day has not been named dared the 48 of James Hilton to turn the slowest qualifying lap he possibly could. So as his competitors were reaching speeds of 150 miles an hour, Hilton turned a blistering pace of 45. <laughs> what a fucking legend. NASCAR, however, didn't see the funny side, and dished him a fine of $500, leaving us fans to wonder how much money he was dared and whether or not James Hilton made his money back. He probably didn't, but at least it makes for a good story. On the flip side, NASCAR would return to its fastest track the following week, where Daryl Waltrip would pick up win number six on the season over the now number two of David Pearson. Then came Michigan, where a young man named Bill Elliott would lead his first ever laps and Richard Petty's championship hopes were rejuvenated. And then Bristol, where they were once again shredded to itty bitty pieces by Jaws. At this point, there were just nine races left, and Darrell still maintained a 160 point lead over the 43. For the fourth year in a row, it looked as though the king would be dethroned, and that loudmouth kid from Owensboro and his ragtag die guard racing team would be taking home their very first cup. But how could they have known that this would be their final win of the entire year? as the following weeks would feature one of the worst championship collapses in the modern era. He did manage to stem the tide at Darlington, where at the track he left his last team and is making one last start for his current team, David Pearson would pick up number 104, the penultimate win of his storied career. And then came a return to Richmond, where to just barely keep himself in the championship picture, Bobby Allison would win a clutch race to put him within 330 points of the leader. But more crucial than that, Waltrip would expand his points lead to 187 with just seven races left. To lose now, he'd have to crumble. He'd have to experience his worst loss of the entire season, which is exactly what he'd do at Dover. Richard Petty wins, Daryl Waltrip spins, and the points gap gets slashed from 187 to 83. An over 100 point swing from one mistake in one race. Things would get even worse the following week when, after leading 184 laps, Waltrip's motor would blow and relegate him down the order. Now, to their credit, the Die Guard team did put together a record-setting rebound, as they completed the fastest engine swap in NASCAR history and had him back out in just 11 minutes. But it still wouldn't be enough, as Petty would finish second to the Grey Ghost and whittle Waltrip's points lead down to just 48. At this point, the Die Guard guard is getting pretty desperate, though thankfully they're headed back to Charlotte, a track they won at earlier this year. And although they wouldn't win like last time, they would finish third to Petty's fourth and hold him off for another week. At North Wilkesboro, the momentum kept on rolling, as Waltrip traded the lead back and forth with Bobby Allison for most of the race. But Allison didn't take too kindly to Waltrip sideswiping him into three with 90 laps still left to run. So out of four, he turned him head on into the wall, allowing Denny Parsons to pass them both. With the frustration of a race ruined and pressure of a championship mounting in his head, Waltrip spent the rest of the race gunning for Allison, taking multiple revenge swipes and drawing the ire of NASCAR, who black flagged him multiple times and relegated him to 13th, while Richard Petty managed a quiet third now just 17 points behind Waltrip with three races to go. As much as we like to complain about it these days, that's the cruelty of motorsport. All it takes is one lap, one pass, one flick of the wheel to derail your whole year. And after the following race at Rockingham, where Waltrip watched four positions back as Petty took his fifth and final win of the season, that points gap that was once over 200 strong had now been demolished to eight points swung the other way. For the first time in five months, Daryl Waltrip would lose the points lead. But no, no way. He wasn't going down like this. He had beaten Petty in numerous one-on-ones. He knew he was the deserved champion. He just had to prove it. And by finishing one spot better in Atlanta, he would retake the points lead heading into the final race, a lead of just two. For context of how close this was, one position was worth five points at the time. Under today's format, this lead would be worth less than a point, a margin that's literally not even possible. It would all come down to this race at Ontario. One last shot for the King to cement his legacy or for Jaws to start one of his own. It all came down to this, the final race of the 79 season. Neither of the championship hopefuls start off quite where they want to be, as Petty qualifies 5th and Waltrip qualifies 10th, but as the race gets underway, both begin to claw their way to the front. Petty made it clear early on that he was the man to beat, as he would lead a lap early and get those crucial 5 bonus points. But Waltrip wouldn't let him have it easy, as a lucky caution on lap 8 would allow him to stay out and collect 5 points of his own. The only caveat is that he'd have to pit later, and before he knew it, he was back in the trenches, fighting an uphill battle, although that's probably something he was used to by now. His entire season had been marred by inconsistency, one freak thing after another keeping him from total dominance. If it wasn't his performance, it was the rain. If it wasn't the rain, it was a rivalry. 
If it wasn't a rivalry, it was the leaders, a half lap ahead, inexplicably crashing and giving the win to his competition. So here today in Ontario, he's trying to make up for that. And his spat with Allison, and his spin in Dover, and his 19 lost points in Pocono, and whatever else is gnawing at his subconscious. But in trying to do all of that, he might have been trying too hard. As when a lap car spins up high right in front of him, he makes one last costly mistake. He's out of control. Waltrip is spinning, sliding. John Resick is up against the wall. Daryl Waltrip. The spin wouldn't hurt his car very much, but it would trap him a lap down, a lap he would never get back, as he was forced to spend the rest of the race watching his competition through an impenetrable window, a cruel vision of what could have been. After taking over for Cale Yarborough and Junior Johnson's number 11, Daryl Waltrip would go on to dominate the early 80s with three championships of his own. But for now, he would have to settle for second, finishing 11 points shy of Richard Petty, who would bring it home quietly in fifth and take home a record-extending, mind-boggling seventh championship. Well, i tell you what, racing's the name of the game, and uh, anytime I get in one, I want to win the dang thing. This year really had it all. It was the last hurrah for the man who had carried the torch for so long and the passing to the man who would carry it into the future. Hard to swallow, but uh, I knew coming out here that uh, I could lose. Teams took chances, and those chances would pay off. For one legendary driver, it was the beginning of a long list of accolades, and for another, it would be the end. It was a year that would usher in a new era, and thanks to that breezy day in Daytona, millions of people all across the country got to see it, and still get to to this day. Although you might be thinking, Richard Petty should be the main character of this story. He's the one who won it all, so why didn't I talk about him as much as Daryl or Dale? Well, there just isn't much to talk about. Whereas other people clashed in iconic nail biters, his calling card was quiet but deafening consistency that you wouldn't even notice until it was far too late. It's how he won Daytona, and it's how he won the championship. But above all else, I don't need to say anything on Richard's behalf, because the numbers do all the talking for me. He's set records that have never and will never be touched, or in some cases even halved by anyone. And with each passing year, his stat line becomes ever more insurmountable, a permanent fixture in the realm of immortality. He is the gold standard, the ceiling, the benchmark. He's the baseline that all who came before and after are compared to, and with this season, he cemented his case forever, as even the best era-defining talents who came after could only hope to match him, never supersede him. He would go on to win 10 more races to make an even 200, a record that, unless cyborgs take over the sport, will never be topped in a thousand years. I could go on and on about the number of records this guy holds that will never be touched, but as for two of them, they wouldn't last long. With his 1979 championship run, Petty became the last owner-driver to win the cup, and the benefactor of the closest championship in NASCAR history, until 13 years later when both records were broken with a sickening crack, a year that, for many, was the single greatest year in the sport's history. We've talked about it before, and I'm sure we'll keep talking about it till the sun burns out of the sky. So let's do it one more time. Let's take a trip back to...